So um, this time I'm going to talk about debugging uh, neural networks for NLP. And um, this is an important thing uh, to kind of figure out how things are working. I think some people might have gone through uh, the exercise of debugging things for assignment one. Um, this will become more important as your systems get larger and, uh, and more complicated. Um, and the reason why debugging is paramount in neural networks is uh, several fold. Like I think everybody has written lots of programs and uh, have uh, you know, debugged lots of programs, etc. Uh, but there are certain features of neural networks that make them uh, difficult. Um, so mo models can often be complicated and opaque. You know, humans aren't really good at looking at large parameter matrices and understanding what's going on underneath. Um, another thing is everything is a hyperparameter. So everything you could possibly change with respect to your model, you know, the network size, model variations, uh, batching size, strategy, optimizer, learning rate, these are all things that can affect your, your final uh, performance. Um, and also there's non-convex uh, stochastic optimization, and this has no guarantee of decreasing or converging loss. So even if you've implemented other uh, types of machine learning like uh, logistic regression or support vector machines, these can be convex optimization problems. And in that case, if you see your loss is suddenly diverging, you know you have a bug in your code because theoretically they should never diverge. Um, so these are all things that make, um, make things difficult in debugging neural nets. Um, and the first key to debugging is understanding what problem you're facing right now. Um, and the worst possible way to do this is uh, this typical situation where you've implemented a nice model, you've looked at the code, it looks okay, you know, you can't, you can't find any glaring bugs, um, and then your accuracy on the test set is bad. Um, so uh, what do you do? And the answer is, um, do you randomly change lines of code uh, until your test accuracy goes up? Um, I see some people nodding. <laughs> um, because it is, some, it is something that you could try doing. Um, but there's, uh, there's more efficient ways to try to figure out what, uh, what kind of problem you're facing. And that's what I'm going to try to talk about in this class. Um, so understanding possible causes of problems. And there's kind of four categories of possible causes. Um, the first one I am referring to is training time problems. And basically what I mean by training time problem is your model cannot learn uh, to decrease the loss on the training data. Um, and I'll go into this a little bit more in a, um, in a second, but I'm not talking about whether your test uh, accuracy goes up. I'm not talking about whether your test loss goes down. I'm talking about whether your training loss goes down here. And there's a number of reasons for this, uh, lack of model capacity, um, inability to train the model properly due to bad uh, optimizers or, um, or uh, batching strategies, for, et cetera. Um, bugs, we all have bugs. You know, if you create a, a nice neural network that has a big model, but then you forget to connect your final predictor to the rest of the neural network, then it's not going to pre predict anything, obviously. So I have seen this bug before myself. So, um, it, you know, it happens to uh, the best of us. And, um, the next thing is decoding or test time bugs. And what I mean by this is a disconnect between, sorry, training, training and test. I should, uh, I should put this. So a disconnect between training and test. So that, that's a really bad typo because I, uh, I messed up two words there. Um, also, um, it could be due to failures of a search algorithm. Um, another thing is uh, overfitting. So overfitting is basically where you're doing well on the training set but doing poorly on the test set. Right. Um, another thing is a mismatch between the function you're optimizing and the function you're finally evaluating your, uh, your model on. So for example, uh, we could be optimizing the likelihood, uh, but uh, testing our model on test time accuracy and making predictions. And those are two different things. They're highly correlated, but they're two different things. Um, so my suggestion would be uh, we don't want to be debugging all of them at once. Um, and rather, we should start at the top and work it down. And that's uh, what I'm going to do in my presentation here. Um, so I'm going to first start talking about debugging at training time. So the way we identify the training time problems is uh, basically by taking the training, uh, you know, the training set, and making sure that our loss function that our model is attempting to optimize is going down on the training set. 
Um, and not only going down, um, but also is it going down basically to zero or going down to a very, very low value if you run uh, for many, many epochs. Um, I wrote 20 or 30 here. You might actually need more uh, on more complicated tests or test sets. Um, but you want this to be going down you know, basically to zero. Um, if it doesn't go down to zero on real data, does it go down to zero on, on fake data, on like super small data where you created, randomly sampled 10 examples from your training set, or even data where you like randomly created data that should look like your real data. And um, in fact, you might even start out by doing this first before you, uh, before you even look at real data. Just you know, create a few fake training examples and, and see whether it works there. Um, so if this is not the case, then you have uh, good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news first is that you have a serious problem uh, that will prevent your model from doing well uh, most of the time. Um, but the good news is that these are among the easier varieties of problems to debug uh, within uh, the various uh, varieties and problems you could be having. Um, so the first thing um, you might consider is maybe your model is too weak. Um, so uh, language processing is hard. And in order to do well at language processing, you very often will need large, uh, larger, higher capacity models uh, to do a good job at it. Um, if you can't even fit the training set, then your model is probably particularly weak. Um, to give an example, um, this is variant on, depending on the type of model you have, but like, let's say you're using an LSTM or some sort of recurrent neural network. Um, if you're doing something like language modeling, where you want to predict the next uh, token, um, I would say in a recurrent neural network, you'll need at least 512 nodes, one layer, um, before you start to get any sort of reasonable results whatsoever. Uh, similarly, uh, for natural language analysis, where you're taking in natural language and trying to predict some class, like text classification or part of speech tags, I'd say you'd still need like about 128. And this is the absolute minimal size that I would suggest. And you know, bigger models will likely uh, do better. Once you start getting this small, you might not even be able to fit your training data. Um, and multiple layers will often do better. So instead of using a single layer, use multiple uh, multiple layers. Also for long sequences, um, this might be a little bit counterintuitive at first, but if you're trying to train a language model, if you're trying to train a character-based language model, you actually need a bigger model. Um, and the reason why I say it seems a little bit counterintuitive is there's fewer characters, right? So you know maybe you wouldn't need as large a model. But in reality, what you're asking a character-level language model to do is to not only predict the next word, but also remember what position you are in the current word you're looking at, remember how to compose a bunch of characters into a word. Uh, so you're giving it more, essentially, work to be doing. Um, so in, empirically, uh, people have found that you need more in, uh, in character uh, level language models. Um, and to, uh, to put this in a different way, um, You need, you need enough capacity of your network to remember all of the things that are necessary to predict, uh, to do the task. So if the output label space is smaller, sometimes you can get away with smaller networks. So for example, if you're just doing text classification, um, a relatively simple way to do text classification is just to have a bag of words, right? And your label space may be five outputs in the case of sentiment analysis. If this is the case, you're taking a very rich input, natural language, and removing everything that is not necessary for uh, estimating the sentiment. Um, so you can throw away a lot of information. And because of that, you can get away with a smaller network. However, for language modeling, in order to do language modeling, you basically need to understand a whole bunch of different things. You need to know syntax. You need to know semantics, um, et cetera. And because of this, you really can't throw away very much information and still expect your model to do well at predicting the next word every single time, right? So um, the more information you need to keep around, the more model capacity you're going to need to have. Um, does that kind of make sense intuitively? So that's kind of a rule of thumb. Of course, you know it's an empirical problem. Did you have a question? Is there any intuition towards adding more units to a layer versus adding more layers? Like when it's better? Is there any intuition um, with respect to adding more units to a layer versus adding more layers? Um, that's a good question. I think. Um,
So th this is not, um, th this, this won't, uh, I think in the end it's largely empirical, but um, is kind of a rule of thumb. I've very rarely seen layers of more than like a thousand nodes give you much better results. Um, however, it seems like the deeper you make your models, the better things get if you have sufficient training data. Um, so, especially if you're, if you're talking about, like, essentially word-by-word -word prediction, um, sorry, word-by-word -word vectors, so something you're going to do attention over at some point, uh, kind of empirically, um, I've, I think maybe the consensus is you don't really need something more than about a thousand layers. Uh, uh, sorry, a thousand, a thousand layers would be pretty crazy. Sorry, a thousand nodes. Um, so I think that will level off a lot faster than uh, making it deeper. Um, uh, with regards to intuition about why you need, why you need what, um, I don't have a really strong intuition about that, other than you need enough model capacity somewhere uh, to make your model uh, work well. Oh, but like theoretically, actually you only need one layer if it's wide enough. Like theoretically, a one layer, uh, one hidden layer, multi-layer perceptor can calculate any function, um, but that doesn't mean much because you actually need to learn it from data. So, um, any, other, any other questions? Okay. Um, however, if you're doing multi-layer models, uh, one thing you should be very aware of is that um, you definitely need to be careful about uh, training them. And extra layers can help, but they can also hurt if you're not careful due to vanishing gradients. And I think I, I answered a question uh, with respect to this in a previous class as well. Um, but basically, there's a couple ways uh, that everybody uses nowadays when they're training deep models. Uh, the first one is residual connections. And residual connections are basically things where you add an additive connection. Um, uh, you could either have like a single layer or you could have multiple layers uh, between these additive connections, but you basically take the input and add it to the output. Um, so instead of taking x and calculating fx, you take x and you calculate fx plus x. And the reason why this is good is for the same reason uh, kind of LSTMs work as well. They keep the gradient flowing all the way back because they don't uh, have nonlinearities to block the gradient path. Um, and the the GRU version of uh, the GRU version of this uh, is um, highway networks, and highway networks basically are a gated um, a gated version where you decide to either keep the stuff from the previous uh, layer, or um, or use the the stuff that the function calculated. I think nowadays fewer people use highway networks and more people use residual connections because they seem to work and they're simpler. So um, very often. You know, one might work a little bit better than the other, but if they're, one is simpler and one is harder, people just do the simpler thing. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure I understand how a highway network is working. Okay, so, um, so the highway network, the way a highway network works is this is like fx in this. Um, uh, so this is the input, uh, the input <coughs> times a weight matrix plus some sort of nonlinearity. Um, this is a, a sigmoid, basically. So it's a sigmoid output. It's a gate. Okay. And you multiply uh, the modified input by a gate. And you modify the original input by 1 minus the gate. So it's very, it's analogous to GRUs, which also took the previous time step, multiplied it by a gate, and uh, the next modified input and multiplied it by 1 minus the gate. OK. Yeah. OK. So this is paramount. If you start using things more than two layers, you will see a really dramatic drop off of accuracy if you don't do something like this. So um, this is just something you should always be doing if you're training deeper networks. Um, OK, other things you could be having trouble with. Uh, trouble with optimization. Um, so you may have an optimization problem. And basically what this means is you have a big high capacity model. It should be able to fit the data, uh, but your training objective is not allowing you to fit the data. Um, and possible causes could be a bad optimizer. A bad learning rate uh, or bad initialization, a bad mini batching strategy. Um, so, to give a reminder about optimizers, we talked about a lot of different ones, you know, like SGD, SGD with momentum, Adagrad, Adam, you know, many others. Um, 
But uh, these, um, some of these are easier to optimize than others. So like SGD is a little bit less easy to optimize than Atom because Atom has some built-in, uh, you know, tricks to control uh, the size of the gradients regardless of what uh, learning rate you choose. Um, so to go into a little bit more detail here, we have learning rate. And learning rate is a very important parameter. If it's too low, it will not learn or learn very slowly. If it's too high, it will learn for a while and then fluctuate and diverge. So if you have, um, if you have your training curve, your ideal training curve is something like this on the training loss. Um, too low learning rate will look something like this. Uh, too high learning rate may look like this. It may look very nice for a while, um, but then go like this or maybe go like this and just kind of stay there without actually, um, uh, without actually going down uh, sufficiently. Um, so one common strategy to use is to start from an initial learning rate and then gradually decrease. And actually in the theory regarding stochastic gradient descent, um, stochastic gradient descent is guaranteed to converge um, uh, to some solution but it's only guaranteed to converge to a solution if you gradually decrease the learning rate. And if you keep the learning rate constant, it actually isn't guaranteed to converge at all. Um, so this is something that you definitely need to be thinking about. Um, other optimizers such as Atom or to a greater extent Atagrad already kind of have this built in. They gradually decrease the learning rate as they accumulate more information about the variance of gradients, uh, for example. So this is more important if you're using regular SGD, less important if you're using something like Atom. Um, also, um, I think a lot of people know this, but there are always a few people who don't know this, which is that you have a different um, learning rate for each optimizer. So um, SGD has a default learning rate of something like 0 0.1. Um, Atom has a default rate, learning rate of 0 0.001. Um, why is it default? It's default because people have tried various ones, and this one seems to work pretty well. Um, but if you accidentally use Atom with 0 0.1 or SGD with 0 0.001, you're going to be in a very painful optimization experience. So um, it's worth knowing these. Or even better, if you're trying to uh, re-implement uh, a previous work, you should definitely pay attention to this and uh, like maybe copy the learning rate they used previously. Um, any questions about this so far? Yes? If you look into computer models like each the network, they always put the models in the order of like convolution, transformation, and moving equation. Mm -hmm. But if you look into the uh, models like transformer, they just put layer convolution just before the like point twice before network, or just at the end of the point twice before network. They do um, I mean, that's a good question. There's actually an interesting um, archive paper uh, which might be very um, useful to some people. It's, uh, it's this. Transformer without tiers. So um, if you don't want to be uh, crying in your implementation of the transformer, you might want to read this paper. Um, but basically, they, they examine different places to put like layer normalization and other design decisions like this. And I, I think basically, even, even in the transformer paper and implementation, they were somewhat inconsistent about the positioning of the layer normalization in early, early days. And I think. The answer is this is largely based on tradition and convention, um, but that tradition and convention might have been the result of experimentation of various things. Also, why don't you put it after every single operation you do? Maybe computational reasons. So maybe this was sufficient to get good results, and then if they added it in other places, it didn't get good results. But again, I, you don't necessarily need to follow convention. Um, you can feel free to try uh, new things, and actually, I talked about this in a previous uh, um, class, but I'll talk about it again. So LSTM, a search space odyssey. 
Um, so this is a, a paper where they basically took the LSTM and they tried a, a ton of different variations of the LSTM. And it turns out the original LSTM was actually pretty good uh, compared to all the variations they tried. But at least they, you know, exhaustively tried all the different variations of the LSTM that they could think of and, you know, empirically validated that. So I think that's something of a lot of value. And there's a reason why this paper has been cited uh, 1,900 times because, you know, it was of value to people to know all of these uh, potential variations. Um, yeah, good, very good question. Yeah. So if I have a fabrication data in the model, how do I choose the optimizer? Okay, yeah, so how should you, how should you choose the optimizer? Um, the, the answer, I guess, is, um, well, so at first, um, Adam with the default learning rate is pretty good. Like that, that's the first thing I would ever, I would try. Uh, the second thing is if there's a previous paper, uh, follow the previous paper and what optimizer did they use, what learning rate did they use when you're trying to uh, reproduce them. Um, if you implement it and your model is not fitting, um, and your model is not fitting or diverging with Adam with the default learning rate, then um, I will be relatively surprised because that doesn't happen very often. Um, but uh, you might want to try increasing or decreasing. It might be a function of your batch size or your grading clipping or something like this. So, um, yeah. Also, if you get to that point during this class, ask the TAs and they can also, <laughs> uh, like, look at your training curves and recommend things as well. So, yeah. Are there any recommended parameters for the uh, learning rate and yielding? Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to talk about that in a second. So I will just, whoops, move on to that. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that after initialization, I think. So um, initialization, um, uh, so neural nets are sensitive to initialization. Um, I haven't really talked about this a lot uh, up until this point. Um, maybe I should have talked about it earlier because it is something kind of fundamental, but um, uh, you, know, you need to do random initialization in neural networks. Um, neural network toolkits do this by default according to some uh, kind of intelligent uh, method. Um, but neural networks are, uh, the standard way to do it is either uh, Gaussian initialization where you initialize with a zero mean uh, something variance Gaussian distribution. Um, uniform range initialization where you simply initialize uniformly within a range. And the more, um, the more like complicated ways of doing this are, that are uh, nevertheless standard are uh, things like Glorat initialization and uh, Hood initialization, which are both uh, like named after the people who came up with them. Um, but basically they initialize in a uf uniform manner, but the range is specified according to the size of the neural network. And the basic idea is if you have an input and an output of a matrix multiply, you would essentially like um, the scale to not change very drastically when you do this matrix multiply or the scale of the gradients to not change very drastically when you do this matrix multiply. Um, um, the latter is common in default, but prior work will usually specify what type of initialization they do if they don't um, use one of the defaults. And when they do, this can be a very important type of parameter. So if they say they initialized uh, uniformly within a range of 0 0.1 and 0.1, Minus one, uh, minus zero point one. Um, then you would uh, you would be best to at least uh, try that out. Um, another nice tidbit from the deep learning uh, book. So if people aren't aware of the book, there's a, a very famous book on deep learning. Um, it's more like an encyclopedia, so I wouldn't recommend you buy it and read it from cover to cover. But you can like look at individual parts. Um, but one interesting tidbit they have there is um, if you have a big multi-layer network you can look at the norm of the gradients at each layer in the network. So you start training and then you log the norm of the gradients at each layer in the network. And ideally the norm of the gradients shouldn't be getting larger or smaller. Um, as you go through the network, you want the gradients to be pretty uniform throughout. And if that's the case, you can adjust the initialization until you satisfy uh, that property at the beginning of training. So, um, you know, if you're, if your gradient just gets bigger and bigger as you go through your network, you might want to decrease your initialization. If it gets smaller and smaller, you might, might want to increase your initialization. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. 
so uh, another thing is mini batching. I talked about this before. Um, actually, I think I think I got a question about this and talked about this already in a previous class. But in case people don't remember every word I say, I'll go through it again. Um, so when we do mini batching in RNNs, we basically group together sentences. Those sentences might be of similar links or different links. Um, when you do uh, loss uh, calculation, um, you do loss calculation, you do masking, um, you take the sum uh, and stuff like this. Um, and in order to do this, it's very common to, um, to bucket or sort your sentences. Um, and what I mean by this is if you're using sentences of different length, too much padding and sorting can result in slow training. Um, and to remedy this, people sort sentences, so similarly linked sentences are in the same batch. Um, but this can also affect performance. So for example, um, this is an example from machine translation by one of my former students, um, where basically um, if you're training with uh, large batch sizes, it's not super important. Um, but is, if you're training with smaller batch sizes, um, randomly shuffling uh, the input which is kind of, randomly shuffling is kind of the theoretically best thing to do with respect to stochastic gradient descent. Um, uh, because in stochastic gradient descent, you want um, all of your data points to be independent and sampled from the same distribution. Um, and if you're not shuffling, uh, each of your mini batches will, will not be distributed in this way. But um, for efficiency re reasons, we do want to be sorting. So how do we sort? Um, if we're doing a sequence sequence model, uh, maybe you want to source by the uh, sort by the source side. Maybe you want to sort by the target side. Um, maybe you want to do the source and target side. Um, maybe you want to do the target side and then the source side. And each of these actually has um, can have an effect on the results. Um, so it's something to be aware of. Um, and uh, this is something that catches people by surprise. They don't think about like batching is something that can affect your results, but actually uh, it can affect your results significantly. Um, also, batch size can be really, really important. And there's an interesting um, relationship between batch size um, and stochastic gradient descent, where basically um, stochastic gradient descent, where you sample a random uh, data point, do a gradient update on it, um, and uh, move in that direction, is a noisy optimization process. So you might be moving in the correct direction, but you'll be having uh, lots of kind of jumps around. Um, whereas if you just had gradient descent, it would be very smooth like this, uh, very smooth like this, moving in the direction that you actually want to be optimizing. So when I say just gradient descent, I mean you calculate your gradient over the whole batch of the data um, and then move in that direction. Um, mini batch gradient descent, where you calculate at multiple data points at the same time, is halfway in between the two. So, is you make your batch size larger, it moves closer to the smooth training surface and uh, essentially becomes stable. Um, so that is an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing to observe. However, there's also a catch, which in, in um, convex optimization problems, uh, gradient descent, regular gradient descent is kind of provably better than stochastic gradient descent. Um, even if it's slower, it's provably, provably better and more stable. However, in non-convex optimization problems, that's not the case. And actually having noise in your gradients at the very beginning of training can help you get out of local optima and find a better global optimum. So uh, you can actually get more stable training, but a worse final convergence rate with a larger batch size. Um, so because of this, unfortunately, batch size is also a hyperparameter. Uh, <laughs> and there's even a... Uh, um, there's even a paper uh, called Don't Decay the Learning Rate, Increase the Batch Size, uh, which suggests you start out with small batches at the beginning of training and then move to larger batches at the end of training. So um, there's kind of an interesting uh, connection between learning rate and, uh, and how large your batches are as well. Um, things like transformers like really large batch sizes. Um, I think the reason why is because um, they have lots of parameters. They have very little inductive bias, uh, so they need very, uh, very stable training. And if you are jumping around, 
um, a whole lot, then this uh, causes them to get in a bad space and not, uh, not work very well. So um, this is something to be aware of as well. Um, are there any questions about that? Yes. Um, so I, yeah, sorry, I, I went over this very, uh, very briefly. This is in sequence sequence models, so it's in um, a model where you're translating from a source side to a target side. So you can either sort by the uh, source side sentence length or by the target side sentence length or both before doing your bucketing or before doing your batching. Okay. Um, oh, actually, sorry. I must have removed my uh, my learning rate to case slide um, uh, because I actually talked about it. I talked about it before um, in a previous class. But uh, just to recap, learning rate decay, the schedule or the thing that I almost always use or the thing that I I would recommend is. Um, Essentially, you watch your dev performance, and when your dev performance starts to uh, diverge, so basically you have something you have something that looks like this, and this is uh, this is not the training performance. This is the dev performance, but um, kind of learning rate also functions a little bit in preventing overfitting. So if you decrease your learning rate, it'll be a little bit harder to overfit. Um, so what I do is I look at dev set performance. Um, and once it starts to diverge, when you get to this point, you rewind your parameters back to where it was when it got the best of performance, and then you uh, then you continue optimizing with the lower learning rate. And this is called uh, I, the reason why I think it's been lost in history, but it's called the new Bob schedule. I don't know who Bob is, um, uh, but like uh, that's the. Um, uh, the name. Uh, so, okay. Any other questions? Okay, so these are all uh, training time. I talked a little bit about overfitting here. Uh, I, I was trying not to talk about overfitting uh, next, but uh, uh, until, you know, the next, next section. But all of these things are ways that you can um, uh, you can try to fit the data better. So now, once you have fit your training set and you have very low loss on your training set, uh, you can fit a small data set, you can fit a large data set quite well. Um, the next thing is debugging your test time performance. And um, the biggest problem of, or one large prob uh, problem that you can have that can cause your training time loss to be good uh, but your test time performance to be bad is um, because you have a bug in your code um, where you have a disconnect between your training functions and your prediction functions. And this is particularly bad when you're doing any sort of structured prediction, like you're doing um, a translation model where uh, you know, you're, you're generating multiple, um, multiple words into output, a parsing model, uh, something like this, where your prediction function is something that's actually relatively complicated. Um, so one of the reasons why this happens is usually your loss calculation that you use at training time and prediction that you use at test time will be implemented in different functions. Um, so for example, we have an encoder decoder.py uh, example that we have on the, um, on the code examples in the website. And it has the cal calculate loss and generate functions. And these are two different functions. They share maybe the encoder or something like that. But uh, you know, after, uh, after the encoder, you have a, a generate function that's um, a little bit different. Um, and this is just a simple software engineering problem. But one of the like, maxims of software engineering is anytime you duplicate code that does the same thing, uh, that's supposed to do the same thing, it's a source of bugs because, you know, half the time duplicated code will not do exactly the same thing. It'll be a little bit different between the two. Um, also, usually, not always, but usually, uh, loss calculation is mini-batched, but generation is not. So you generate, generate one output at a time, um, but you do not, uh, you do not, uh, sorry, you calculate loss for multiple outputs at a time, but you generate one output. So how do we debug um, mini-batching? How do we debug our mini-batching? 
Um, one of the most common um, problems of mini-matching, before I talk about debugging, is you make a mistake in padding or masking. So you accidentally don't pad appropriately, or you accidentally don't mask out your outputs appropriately, and you get something where you would get a different result uh, between when you're calculating with a mini-batch and when you're calculating with just a single example. Um, so the bad news is this is one of the most frequent bugs I, uh, you know, I experience or run into. The good news is it's actually really easy to debug. Um, and the reason why is because um, you can simply calculate the loss with a large batch size and then calculate the loss for each sentence individually and sum them together. And these numbers should be basically the same, uh, other than you know, numerical precision. So they should be the same to like 0 0.001 uh, absolute difference or something like that, um, or even, even less. So um, this is good because um, I assume that you know, if you've taken a software engineering class, hopefully they taught you unit testing. Apparently, this is not common. Uh, this is not every software engineering test, test uh, teaches you this. But um, unit testing is basically you write little tests that test each piece of your um, uh, of your software and kind of toy data. Um, you can write a, p a unit test that um, that tests each uh, piece of this on toy data. And actually, maybe I'll even give an example of this. So I have, a, um, I have a neural MT toolkit that we made called, um, uh, called XNMT, uh, and we have a tests directory that has lots of tests. We have a test batchers file. And um, sorry, that's, that's not it. So you haven't looked at this in a looked at this in a while. Maybe it's this one. So yeah, there we go. Assert single loss equals batch loss. So you write a test like this, you put it into the Python unit testing framework. Um, and basically what this is doing is it's doing a for loop over the single sentences and calculating the loss. And then it's doing a uh, a batched version and calculating the loss and uh, asserting that they're equal at the end. So this is really, really useful. Um, I find writing unit tests for these sort of things um, also to be good in general because they're run on really small data that runs really quickly. So um, even just finding errors, uh, making sure your software didn't regress and break something uh, silly uh, later, you can very often catch this by running your unit tests. So I, I would suggest this. Um, I think this is a, an example of a moderately well-tested library, um, kind of like, uh, so you, you can take a look at that if you want. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so another thing is debugging any sort of structured generation, any generation where you want to ge uh, not just predict a single label, but predict multiple labels, uh, be it a uh, multi-word sentence or a parse tree or, or whatever else. Um, and uh, with respect to this, your decoding code that actually generates the output um, should get the same score as the loss calculation, assuming you're uh, trying to find, in your generation code, you're trying to find the thing with the maximal um, uh, log likelihood. So a way you can do this is you can call your decoding function so you can generate an output. In generating your output, of course, you'll want to calculate the score of the output. And the reason why you want to calculate, I mean, to, calculate, to do search, you need to calculate a score, right? So you'll get the score of the output. So now you have an output and its score according to your decoding function. Um, and then you can call your loss function on your generated output. And the score of the two functions should be the same, right? Surprisingly often, this is not the case. You call your loss function, and the score of the loss function will be different than the score that you get from your like, text generation function, for example. Um, and you can also create a unit test for this. So um, you, uh, it's as simple as uh, call your generate function, call your count, count loss function, uh, make sure the two outputs are the same. 
So once you've done these two things, once you've calculated your unit test for this and you've calculated your unit test for this, you should know that your mini-batched loss calculation that needs a training time is the same as your single sentence uh, output. And the output you get from your decoding function, uh, the score you get from your decoding function, uh, should be the same as the score that you get from uh, your single loss function. So now you basically ensured that your, um, your outputs for decoding and, um, uh, and training are the same. This will kill a large number of errors in your, uh, in your system. So I highly recommend doing this. Um, any other questions? OK. OK, beam search. This is another, another problem. So your search algorithm might have bugs. So uh, beam search, instead of picking one high probability word, maintains several paths. So this is an example um, where we're maintaining two paths. Um, so we, at the first time step, we have AB, we have BB, et cetera. And as I may have talked about before, um, decoding or finding the optimal probability path in, um, uh, in encoder decoder models with an infinite context is an NP hard problem. So there's no way to do it exactly uh, unless NP equals MP, and I wouldn't count on that. Um, so uh, we, we do approximate search, but by spending more time, we can make our approximate search better, basically. So we, um, uh, we increase our beam size to three, and um, we should have a better approximation. We increase our beam size to four, we should have a better approximation still. Um, and I'm gonna talk about advanced search algorithms in a later class, but how do we debug this? Um, and this is particularly important to debug because um, uh, this is, may, adds complexity to the model. It's much harder than regular sampling or greedy search. Um, but basically, as you make search better, the model score should get better um, almost all of the time. Um, so you know, if, if you make your beam wider, your model score should get better most of the time. Um, so what you can do is you can run search with varying beam sizes and make sure you get a better overall uh, model score uh, with larger sizes. Um, however, this is not the case always. So um, you can't depend on this to be the case always. Um, like, if you are tired of hearing me talk and want a brain teaser, try to come up with a pathological uh, pathological search graph that would uh, that would cause a beam of two to fit. Uh, to fail, but a beam of one to not fail to find the hard max, and you can come up with one. Um, but basically, most of the time, this should give you better um, better scores in real models. So you can just um, increase the beam size and make sure most of the time uh, your your search does indeed get better. I'm um, sorry, your model um, your model score gets better. And again, you can create a unit test to make this. Okay. Um, another. Uh, so, any questions about this? The last one, I shouldn't have put this last, I should have put this first maybe, but um, look at your data. Um, the only reason why this is last is there's not a straightforward answer. You can't create a unit test to do this, um, but it's still almost as effective as any of the others. So um, decoding uh, generation problems can often be detected by looking at the outputs and realizing something is wrong. Here's a real example. It was an off, off by one error in our generation of outputs. So um, our system looked really, really good. It got a pretty reasonable uh, blue score um, for evaluating machine translation results. Um, but it, when we actually looked at them, they looked like went to the store yesterday, bought a dog, and it had no subject in the output. And we know that in English, you should have a subject in the output most of the time. Um, so we realized it was dropping the first word in the sentence every time, uh, just because we had a, a mistake in our output generation code. Um, we wouldn't have caught this if we looked at any of those tests. We also wouldn't have caught this by looking at the blue score uh, directly, because the blue score looked pretty good. It looked pretty reasonable, um, maybe a little bit low. Um, I also have a funny example. Um, so we have the abbreviation for University of Nebraska at Kearney, uh, which is UNK. <laughs> um, and our system was ac accidentally turning this into an unk. Um, and, and generating unks in the output. And uh, we also probably would not have realized this if we weren't uh, looking at our data carefully. So um, 
They're set. Um, another thing that you can do um, to uncover possible errors is uh, quantitative analysis. Um, this is good both uh, for just debugging your system and for uh, figuring out you know, what's going right, what's going wrong. Um, so, like for example, um, if you have a system that you thought should be improving a particular aspect of the output, um, you would like to be able to quantify whether that system is, uh, is actually improving that. So to give an example, like let's say you devised some model that uh, was supposed to work better for low frequency words, whatever reason. Maybe it's looking at subword information, maybe it's uh, using massively pre-trained word embeddings that were pre-trained on larger data than before or uh, something like that. Uh, so what you would really like to know is, is accuracy on low frequency words increasing or is accuracy on, um, on words that uh, have a particular um, sentences that have low frequency words increasing. Maybe you focused on a syntactically motivated model. Um, you would like to know is syntax or word ordering getting better? Are you doing better on long distance dependencies of some way? Um, are you, you focused on search? Are you reducing the number of search errors? Um, so basically, uh, what this means is it's not like a unit test, but it's quantify, quantifying um, the outputs on a more fine grained level than you would uh, have uh, if you just looked at one holistic score. And I have an example of this. Um, this is a toolkit that we made uh, that I think is quite useful. Um, it's called ComparemT. It stands for Compare My Text. Um, and Basically, what it does is you run it on two um, on outputs from two systems, and it generates a report that looks like this. It, and it has statistics like this is for two machine translation systems. One's a phrase-based machine translation system. One's a neural machine translation system. And it um, it outputs the blue score. So of course you you have your overall accuracy score. But in addition to your overall accuracy score, it outputs things like length ratio, which is like how long are the outputs compared to the, um, to the expected outputs. And we see the phrase-based system is getting things that are closer to the length that we expect. Also, we have word accuracies, where the word accuracies, um, the accuracies of outputting words are bucketed by the frequency of the word. And we can see that low frequency words, the phrase based system is doing better, um, but high frequency words, the neural MT system is doing better. Um, we also have words by part of speech tag. So um, we're outputting um, uh, the score of words by part of speech tag, and we can see that um, the neural MT system is better at conjunctions and prepositions. And this is a different variety of preposition. But if you look at conjugated, if you look at regular verbs, the neural MT, uh, the phrase based MC system is better, but conjugated verbs, the neural MT system is better. So basically, um, what this is telling you is it's looking beyond a single number and, uh, and telling you, beyond, um, you know, like characteristics of the output that might be useful in debugging. And if you're generating text, I highly recommend this toolkit. If you're not generating text, um, still a similar philosophy is useful. So like, let's say you have, um, let's say uh, you want to build a, um, you want to build a system that should work well on biomedical text. Maybe you have a biomedical lexicon and you want to identify which sentences have lots of biomedical words and don't. And then you bucket the accuracies by the one that have a higher concentration of biomedical words or whatever. So I, I I think this is very, very useful, and um, having kind of a set of tools that allow you to do this easily is, is a good thing to have in your toolbox. Um, yes. Okay. Um, any any questions here? Okay. Um, so the next thing is battling overfitting. And this is, um, once you've gotten this far, that is kind of good news um, because it means you, uh, you probably don't have uh, too many bugs. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one really important thing. So how do you diagnose bugs in your search algorithm? Um, the easiest way um, to diagnose bugs in your search algorithm is using the unit tests. But another meta way 
Um, another better way to do this, to um, identify it without actually writing unit tests, is um, you get really good loss on the training set, but you get really bad accuracy on the training set. So that would be um, an indication that your uh, decoding algorithm or something doesn't work. So um, I'd still recommend you write the unit tests anyway, because they're not very hard to write and, and, um, and generally useful. But um, uh, you know that's a, another good thing to look at. So OK, now moving to battling overfitting, you have good loss on your training set. You have good accuracy on your training set. But you have bad loss on your dev set. Um, so this is on your dev set or your test set. So this is indicative that you are fitting your training set well, um, you're getting good accuracy on it, but it's just not generalizing to the dev set. Um, so symptoms of overfitting, yeah, so this, this is what it looks like. So you can see this is an example. Um, ignore the accuracy part for now. That's, that's not the important part. We see our loss, and we see that um, the loss on the training set in red is still going down. But the loss on the dev set is going down for a little while, and then it's diverging. Um, so this is the exact symptom you should be looking for for overfitting. Um, so um, one thing that you should know is a sufficiently large uh, neural network should be able to um, memorize your training data, like I said before. Um, and this is a nice, it's kind of a thought-provoking paper. There's a few claims in the paper that I don't completely agree with. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, actually, I talked about this one uh, in this class as well. But basically, like, um, you can randomly shuffle the training labels um, so there's no uh, correlation between the input and the labels, and it can still learn to memorize these labels. Um, so because of this, we know, you know, our, our large over-parameterized neural networks can memorize the training data, um, but the important thing is uh, whether they can generalize if we want them to actually be, uh, be useful in practice. Um, so there's a number of reasons why your model might not be generalizing. The most important reason I'm not mentioning here is that your model's not a good model. Um, good models with good inductive biases that match the problem uh, tend to generalize better. Um, that's kind of the, the interesting part, but it's also the part that's harder to solve uh, because you need a deep understanding of the problem. You need to devise your model in an appropriate way. Uh, use whatever information sources you have at, at your, at available. So that's what the whole class is about. So because that's what the whole class is about, I'm not going to uh, talk about it extensively in this in particular section. Um, so like, let's say, you know, putting aside the model for a second, um, there are also um, problems. So adaptive gradient methods. Um, uh, some optimizers tend to overfit more than others. Um, there was an argument uh, in this paper here that adaptive gradient methods might tend to, uh, to overfit more. So Adam um, in purple is, um, uh, is going down like this. Oh, but yeah, actually, this it, it maybe isn't even a... Um, this maybe isn't even a good example because this uh, here, um, Adam is not even un it's not even overfitting, it's underfitting because it's not fitting the training data as well as SGD. But um, I've seen empirical examples. Uh, so like, I don't know if that's clear from this thing here. So this is training error on the left, this is test error on the right. And um, like SGD itself is achieving better, uh, better training errors. So that's not overfitting, that's underfitting the training data. Um, uh, if, the, if Adam was going down on the training data but not, um, but not uh, generalizing to the test data, that would be overfitting. Um, so actually, I've presented these slides like four times and this is the first time I've actually realized this, uh, by, looking at this by looking at the slide. So I'll change the example next time. But, the, um, the symptom of overfitting is basically um, your, training, your training loss goes down, your test loss doesn't go down as much. And Adam does tend to do this uh, quite frequently, where you achieve good training error, but you're achieving less good test error than SGD uh, itself. Uh, that being said, Adam is a lot more stable, and it takes longer to optimize than SGD, so I still recommend it. But if you really uh, want to get slightly better accuracy uh, considering that in your optimizer, is there any intuition as to maybe when this overfitting occurs? Like, yeah, it occurs at the end, but is it because it like maybe jumps into a 
like a poor area to begin with, or at the end it gets worse, in which case maybe you could switch to something simple. So, so when does overfitting, when does this overfitting occur, or why does overfitting occur in, um, in general? And the reason why overfitting occurs, or why generalization doesn't occur, is the whole idea of machine learning, and in general, in neural networks in particular, is you're trying to take your training data and extract useful patterns while throwing away spurious patterns. That's the whole, I guess, concept behind machine learning. Um, so you want to extract patterns that are indicative of the labels and throw away any in spurious information that is not indicative of the labels. Um, the intuition behind why adaptive gradient methods might overfit more is because they have more ability to focus on rare events. So rare events are still useful. Um, like for example, a, um, a rarer instance of a positive sentiment word or some sort of co uh, word combination like out of this world. Let me, let's say out of this world only appeared in your training data once. An adaptive gradient method would be more equipped to fit the data and say, oh, out of this world seems very indicative of positive sentiment. I haven't seen this very often, um, but because I haven't seen this very often, I'm going to upweight the learning of those parameters. However, for every out of this world, there's a whole bunch of other spurious phrases that have nothing to do with actual sentiment. Um, and it, by increasing your ability to fit those phrases, it's more likely to overfit. Um, so that's the intuition behind why adaptive gradient methods do tend to overfit. Now to go back to your actual question, um, is there any indication when it will happen? Um, I guess maybe the answer is around here. Um, or, or maybe, or, sorry, actually I should be looking here, maybe around here. Uh, so th this is a facetious answer to a serious question, and I apologize for that, but I think probably the answer is, um, there may be an answer, but uh, until we have, until there would be a good way to identify that, you know, through some sort of research uh, paper, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I, I've never seen anything like that or any method like that that's widely used in the literature. So. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Though. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, is it really helpful to train a model to 50 epochs? And I see it's probably decreasing its learning rate seven or eight times. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's helping here. Um, it, it depends uh, a lot on how large your data set I th is, I think. So if you have a like gigantic data set, um, if you have a gigantic data set that you, um, uh, you can't process it on, um, then you probably might not even need one epoch. So I, I heard something, I don't know if this is true anymore, but I heard uh, Google doesn't train on all their speech data, uh, despite being Google. Um, and the reason why is they just have so much of it that they can't make one epoch through, uh, through the data because every single query you put into your phone for Google becomes a training example for them, right? So, um, and that's a lot of queries. So, uh, another thing, uh, so another thing um, that I should definitely uh, mention, which is really, really useful if you want to get good accuracy in a practical system is there is no need ever to randomly downsample your data. Um, so very often people will say, I have too much data, I can't handle all of my data. I would like to randomly downsample, uh, um, I would like to randomly downsample my data to one tenth of the size. Um, so you randomly downsample your data to one tenth of the size and then you do 10 epochs over it. Um, so why not just do one epoch over all of your data, right? Um, that will reduce your overfitting um, and, uh, and just be better all around. Um, so you don't necessarily need to only evaluate your model after every epoch. You can evaluate your model after one tenth of an epoch or you can evaluate it after one um, one hundredth of an epoch or one one thousandth of an epoch if you have a truly humongous uh, data set. So, um, if you divorce the idea of evaluating after every epoch from how you uh, 
how you build your data, it's perfectly fine to just use all of your data. Um, and it's, it's also really fun because if you don't make multiple passes through your data, you never overfit. You just keep on getting better. So it's fun to watch your dev accuracy just go down with your training accuracy. So um, I, I highly recommend five stars. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, have, so they, they actually tried language modeling in this paper, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, if I remember correctly, I, I read this paper in 2017 when it came out, and I haven't read it since then. Um, but I, don't, I doubt that anybody has done this extensive of an evaluation. Um, and this extensive hyperparameter tuning for SGD um, in those settings. If somebody has, I'd be interested in seeing it. But uh, I think the huge advantage of Atom is it doesn't require much hyperparameter tuning, and it's way faster uh, to train most of the time. This is, this is an anomalous result for Atom in this particular thing. Usually, Atom is way faster at the beginning of training. Um, so yeah. Uh, but like, I. I I think people use Atom because it's convenient, um, but I would be very interested if there's a counterexample uh, where SGD does actually perform better after it. Uh, Atom actually does perform better after it sets yeah. so, Yes? Building on that, that's from CIFAR 10, so that's an image classification? That this is. This is, yeah. yeah. Did they also, you're right, they have the language model. And the results are, are pretty similar, if I remember? Uh, yes. SGD is lowest for war and peace. Uh, but yeah, any, anyway, you can, <laughs> you can look yeah. at the paper. But thank you for uh, checking. Um, cool. So um, early stopping and learning rate decay. Actually, I forgot, where, um, I forgot that I had this slide, so I talked about it without the slide. But yes, um, uh, you, should, uh, you should be decaying. Um, learning rate decay is useful even for Atom. It's not just useful for SGD. So uh, some people contended that learning rate decay on the dev set was only really useful for SGD because Atom automatically adjusts the learning rate. I have never seen that empirically be the case. I've always found um, I've always found that learning rate decay uh, on the dev set does help generalization. Maybe not optimization of the training loss, but it, it's useful for uh, for um, preventing over. Um, dropout, so neural nets have lots of parameters prone to overfitting. Um, dropout randomly zeroes out nodes in the hidden layer with probability P at training time only. So um, you, you drop them out uh, and, and zero them out um, because, in, yeah, and you need to scale them and stuff like this. This is something that you definitely should be trying or doing. It is very effective. There's lots of other methods to kind of regularize neural networks. Uh, one example would be um, taking, penalizing the uh, L2 norm of the parameters. So this is something that's really, really common in like convex optimization or regularized optimization. I have never had very much success with that myself in neural networks. Dropout is con consistently works, um, but uh, you know, on top of dropout, other regularization methods, I've never seen a consistently a consistent improvement. You know, sometimes sometimes you'll get an improvement, sometimes you won't. But it, it, at the very least, you should be trying dropout, and I'd only try other regularization methods after you do. Okay. Um, any questions about this? Yes. What do you think about stopping training if the loss or metric on the dev set stops? Oh, uh, stopping training if the metric on the dev set stops uh, reducing? Yes, always, uh, you, you should always do that. Um, but uh, there's a concept of patience. So you, you keep training for a while, even if the dev set is not getting better, um, and you only stop after it hasn't improved for like five dev evaluations or something like that. 
Um, but you know, your dev set is your best approximation to what your test set is going to look like. So you should just pick the model that does best on the dev set according to whatever metric you care about. I'm actually going to talk about that in a second. But yeah, go ahead. Re yeah, rewind the parameters to the, the best point. Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, so uh, a final thing, and this is something that people don't think about quite as much, um, but I think it's really important, is the mismatch between the thing you're optimizing at training time and the final thing that you actually care about. Um, so we have our loss function. So it's very, very common to optimize for maximum likelihood for training. Um, but even though the likelihood is getting better, accuracy by whatever metric of accuracy that you care about can be getting worse. Um, to give a very simple example, this is MNIST. So it's a simple, uh, very simple image classification task. Um, but you look at your loss, and your loss um, basically uh, is uh, the best maybe at epoch 5 or something like that. But your accuracy at epoch 5 is definitely not very good. It continues getting better. And even after 50 epochs, it hasn't, it, you know, it's not convincingly converged or it's not getting worse on the dev side. Um, so why is this? There's a very, very simple um, you know, explanation for this, which is that the model is continuing to learn. It's continuing to learn to get better at hard examples. Um, where the hard examples are the ones on the hard examples on the training set are kind of the ones that it's still failing at here. It wasn't able to learn them immediately. But maybe there are some hard examples in the dev set, so learning the hard examples on the training set um, will improve this accuracy. However, at the same time, the model hasn't stopped learning the easy examples. And the model keeps on learning on the easy examples, and it's training and training and training, and it's improving. Um, it's improving the uh, loss, which is the likelihood of the correct answer, um, from 0 0.9 to 0 0.99 to 0 0.999 to 0 0.99999. So it, it keeps on reducing this loss. And let's say you have a few outliers in your dev set where the model really, really thinks it's a 5, um, but the, uh, the actual answer is 6 or something like that. And if that's the case, your loss on these really certain outliers will be going up and up and up. So it will be going from, uh, it will be going from like, let's say, uh, one in log 10 space to two to three to four to five. So you'll have a few examples where the model is uh, making really, really confident mistakes. And that is reflected in this loss function here. Um, however, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong. So that's not reflected in the accuracy. That's reflected in, in the loss. Um, so, or it's reflected in the accuracy, but it's only reflected once. It's not increasing as your trading is going on. So this is super common. It's, um, uh, you know, a very uh, uh, good thing to know about. But then the question is, do you want a model that's good at predicting the probability of the outputs, which is reflected in this likelihood, or do you want a model that's good at um, giving one best outputs? And if the answer is the latter, uh, then you'll actually want the model at epoch 49 instead of epoch 5. Um, another example, this, um, so this is a starker uh, example that I also talked about a little bit before. But basically, um, beam search is finding things with better model score, um, but it is uh, causing the blue score to go down. So basically, as you're increasing the model score, um, it, the, blue, the blue score is going down. And the reason for this is because maximum likelihood training um, favors very short sentences um, in text generation. And the reason why it favors short sentences is we have a model that's calculating the probability of every word. And probabilities tend to be less than one. And so, um, you know, really long sentences will have lots of uh, probabilities multiplied in and get uh, lower uh, scores. Um, so, uh, like, maximum likelihood uh, training is not correlated with even accuracy in simple classification, and it's even less correlated 
uh, with getting a good score in things like text generation. Um, so how can we fix this? Um, I'm actually going to talk about this a lot in a few coming classes. Um, but it's complicated and I have five minutes, so I'm not going <laughs> to... I'm not going to talk about it extensively here. Um, so we're going to talk about like structured max margin training, minimum risk training, reinforcement learning methods to do this. Um, but there's a much simpler way, which is early stopping according to your evaluation metric. Um, so this is exactly what we just talked about a few minutes ago. So um, when you want to uh, pick the best model to be outputting, you should pick the best model according to the metric that you actually care about. Um, like evaluation accuracy is opposed to uh, the metric that has best loss. However, that being said, like let's say like accurate calibration of your probabilities in your predictions being really important. Uh, if that's something that's really important to you, maybe the maximum likelihood loss actually is the uh, correct thing that you should be optimizing. So in that case, you'd want a different model than this one. Okay. okay. So final words. Um, my final, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is about the last thing. Yeah. So I think I have this with the homework where I was probably evaluating the validation, like accuracy too often. And so sometimes I would get like a really high accuracy pretty early on in the training. Mm -hmm. And I would see somewhat high accuracy, but not quite that high. But if I'm taking like a lot of, and this is also with a small validation set. So if I'm taking too many kind of, if I'm checking too often, I feel like it might be a fluke that I get a high accuracy. Oh, so if you check too often, it might be a fluke that you get um, that you get a high accuracy, um, and you might be like overfitting the depth set, basically. Um, yeah, that, that's a that's a danger. Um, it's especially a danger if you have a really small depth set. So, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I I don't have much more to say about that. I mean, like one thing one thing you might potentially do in that case. I've never. I usually don't work with really, really small dev sets, so I, um, I, I haven't worried about this much before, but you might consider um, smoothing, uh, smoothing the accuracies by taking the rolling average of the five around that one, weighted in some way to make sure um, that it is actually legitimately a good place in training as opposed to just being a fluke. But um, that's just something I came up with now I've never tried before, so yeah. Uh, when you do the learning rate decay, is it on the actual metric that you're evaluating on, or is it on the loss? When you do learning rate decay, is it on the metric you're evaluating on, or the loss? Um, I would suggest that probably doing it on the metric you care about is better. Because, yeah. like, that's the thing you actually want to be, um, uh, you know, maximizing in the end. Okay. Um, so final words, reproducing previous work. This is uh, part of your uh, assignment number three, so this is really important to be able to do uh, this well. Um, so it's hard because everything is a hyperparameter in neural networks, um, but uh, if code is released, you can find and reduce the differences one by one. For assignment number three, you're not allowed to use code uh, directly from previous work. What I would suggest you do is you read the paper and implement it all by yourself, so it will all be your own code. Um, and then, if you're having trouble reproducing, go back and look at the look at the code um, that is released, just so you can reduce the differences. So that would, you know, that wouldn't be copying because you wouldn't be copying code directly. It would still be your own code, but it would help you debug. Um, if code is not released, then this makes things a lot harder. Like honestly, I mean, all I can say is try your best. Um, but. Uh, feel free to contact the authors about details. Um, people will tend to want to respond. Um, I have some hints about how you can increase your response rate. Um, number one, introduce yourself. Um, say you're a master's or PhD student at uh, CMU, um, and you're interested in, uh, in like reproducing somebody's work um, uh, for a research project or a Maybe research project is even better <laughs> that you're working on, um, and uh, that will you know motivate people to respond because you know you know this person is working on this seriously. They might uh, they might make something out of it. Another thing is just to temper your expectations. Um, graduate students at universities have a relatively high response rate, but sometimes they're busy and don't like to respond. So you can also uh, add all the co-authors 
Um, so email their advisor or whatever as well. Um, and then their advisor will prod them into responding to you. Um, yeah, companies, um, at companies, it can be more hit or miss depending on how open or secretive the company is. So um, then you, know, you might get an answer, you might not. Um, uh, for your assignment two, you have to turn in a survey and a project plan. And one of the things we'll be doing during the project plan uh, vetting is to look and see whether we think you can feasibly reproduce the work itself. So um, if we don't think you can, we might suggest something that's a little bit easier or, um, or might more likely to be able to reproduce. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Are there any final quick questions? No? Okay, we'll finish up for today. Thanks.